Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. Recap on species. So we're talking about specifically about the mountain gorilla. That's a subspecies of the. What can they teach us? Was the gorilla that was taught the American Sign Language, and Coco could use over 500 signs and understand. Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris, and I'm Angie, and this is part two on gorillas. <laughs> so yes. How you doing, Angie? Good. Doing you can good. call me Gorilla Angie. Grand gorilla Angie. Angie. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's we'll call this. Absolute. Well, we've we've been talking about gorillas a lot, so I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it today, and uh, it's gonna. We're gonna have a. A fun time talking about the mountain gorilla and learning more about yeah. its behavior and conservation. Yeah, and we're just continuing the the conversation about them and and how amazing they are. You know, the last episode we talked about their natural history and the different species and things like that. And now we just kind of want to get more into the, the nuts and bolts, right? The physiology, the nutrition. Sure. Yes. Yeah. And if you're just tuning in, and you didn't listen to part one. I highly recommend you do listen to part one because. <laughs> There's a wonderful excerpt about why you should care about gorillas. Mm, in yeah, case you don't, yeah. we will convince you. Bada bing, bada boom. One, two, three, on why they're important for us to spend our time and energy talking about and conserving, and why the great, amazing international collaborations and efforts to save these guys and make their numbers go from, yeah, you know, hundreds to mm -hmm. at least up to a thousand today is so huge and so monumental and inspiring for conservations, the work that the conservationists and zoos do. So check that episode out if you haven't already. Uh, otherwise, stay tuned. It's going to be a fun ride today. Yeah. And hopefully you listened to Ron Evans interview again. That was amazing uh, talk about gorilla, gorilla conservation, the work he's done, his trips to Africa, things that he's seen. It's just a uh, great interview. Just a, a quick re recap on species. So we're talking about specifically about the mountain gorilla. That's a subspecies of the eastern gorilla. So there's two major species of gorilla, the western gorilla and then the eastern. So the mountains and, and the mountain and eastern lowland gorilla, both are, are critically endangered. The westerns are considered critically endangered, but their populations are a little bit bigger that we'll get to. Now, just to kind of start this off, we were, we left off, uh, you know, talking about their, their life spans and things like that. Some fun facts, you know, like I've said, gorillas are scared of water and mountain gorillas hate when it gets rain. So they're in these cloud forests. They hate getting wet, which is hilarious. So they, they actually like use leaves and stuff as kind of like umbrellas. To, <laughs> like, cool, shield man. Them. Absolutely. I mean, brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Smarter than me because I, I mean, John was actually just teasing me the other day that we live in Florida. We have a rainy season here in the summertime. It'll rain pretty much every mm -hmm. day for like 20 or 30 minutes at four o'clock come uh, July, August and September, June, July, August, September around there. And I don't have an umbrella. I don't know what, yeah. I think it's because I Hot Florida rain is like nothing. I'm mean, like, whatever. Mm -hmm. This is nothing mm -hmm. compared to cold snow, Chicago, Michigan right. that I'm used to. So it just doesn't seem like that bad to me. But I sh when I'm going to important meetings and need to be somewhat presentable and you know, going from location A to location B, I should have an umbrella. It's like that's like right. an adult thing to have is an umbrella in your car. Of course, my husband has one because he does adulting very well. <laughs> I don't often. So <laughs> so <have> pulled me. <laughs> I'm gonna I know, right, right, right. So I uh I'm gonna take a note from the gorillas and just get an umbrella because I have the ability to have a tool to protect myself and they obviously do it because they're smart. Yeah. I should do yeah, it as well. Yeah. Right, right. And just uh, a reminder in the in the the mountain gorillas, their their fur's a little bit longer, their hair's a little bit longer because it does get very cold up there in these cloud right, forests that they live in. Yeah, four thousand meters, right? So yeah, that's up there. That's they need the longer, the longer hair. Even scientists have noticed that you know these these gorillas are ranging higher 
at higher elevation because of human pressure, you know, where the normal historical range was a little bit lower, they're getting pushed higher and higher to survive, you know, yes. poaching and other things. So, you know, it's kind of, and it does get freezing up there. So this, this thick coat helps them stay warm, you know, and then also in the sunlight and things like that. Also insects, you know, I can just imagine the insects in the deep, deep jungle. Like I've been out in the field a lot when I was in the army or camping or whatever. Uh, and some of these deep jungles, it's just like a swarm just get oh, I in Florida, you did right? Swamp here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, or an Amazon. Well, when that's you were why down you were. There. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. When you're hiking through the Amazon or in Africa, when I was out in the bush, you mm-hmm. the trick of it is you wear. It doesn't matter what the temperature is. You yeah. wear long pants and long um, long sleeve shirts for sure. Um, light, if you're in, if you're in a hotter climate, you want to, you have them be uh, lighter colors and lighter. But no, no, you wanna. You want that extra shield for uh, pretty much mainly for the insects and sometimes for the bushes and plants, but mm-hmm. right, protection's right. key. Yeah, no, and they and they some of the behavior I know you're going to get to, but it, I did read when temperatures are low, the groups will huddle together, so to kind of stay warm sure. as a group. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Um, we're going to talk about you know you talk about the males. Males are called silverbacks. You know, maybe when we get to to repro or things like that, the behavior. I did read that baby mountain gorillas are scared of chameleons and caterpillars. <laughs> that was kind of funny. <laughs> so, just some fun facts to start off this episode. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they definitely have personality. I think that that's um, you know uh, that's putting it mildly, and they yeah, have they, yeah. have they definitely have been. There's been several researchers' notes about uh, yes, the basically infants. Or when I say infants, I mean young gorilla or juvenile. Um, yeah, just not really liking reptiles and insects. Maybe how a young child would be scared of one until you explain it to them. And they'll actually, yeah, they'll move. They'll go way out of their way to not go past a chameleon or a caterpillar and things like that. So, um, right. it's I definitely so. oh. definitely cute. It's behaviors oh, we can yeah. all relate to, right? Especially if we have little kids. Yeah, you know, talking about their body, their digestive system, things like that. They are folivores, so a leaf eater. Foilage, yeah. So they primarily eat leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stems, the shoots, uh vegetation. The vine, shrubs, bamboo, the roots. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they like bamboo if they find it, which is crazy, you know, especially we talked about pandas. So they they really like high quality, high protein, low fiber, and low tannin foods, you know, and this is some of the nutrition research. And I was like, why tannin? You know, so I looked up tannin. Tannin is like from bark and stuff and it's bitter, you know, it's bitter tasting. So I imagine for them, they wouldn't like that. The males can eat up to 40 pounds of vegetation a day. That's which a lot. Is insane. That's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of food. Jeez, yeah. that's like a horse. Uh, oh, yeah, a they horse. eat. A, but they, they don't weigh. Yeah, they eat. They don't wear nearly as much as a horse. No. Huh. No, no, it, it, you know, 400 you pounds. Sure? So they eat, yeah, that's what they can eat up to 40 pounds. Is that average? No, that's a large silverback, you know, eating that much. Per okay. Day. But think about it. We are, their digestive system, you know, kind of getting on that. They do have large, they're very similar to us, but their large intestines is, are just bigger. So they can ferment a little bit of this, but they probably don't get as much nutrient value, say, out of, say, as a, a, a ruminant, you know, a cow or, you know, antelope, deer, things like that, or a horse or zebra, it's hind gut fermenter. So they get a lot of energy nutrients out of that. So think about it. So they're, they're, they're a hominid and they need to get as much nutrients out of it. So to, to get, you know, I, I don't know, I would love to talk to a vegan or a vegetarian. How much food do you have to eat? To get energy, right. you know, that some of the other foods are not giving it to you, right? Right. Yeah. So to- it's like, I guess, I guess if I only ate celery, maybe I could eat a lot, like a lot more, 10 pounds of celery a day yeah, uh, or something. Yeah. But wow. I, and I read too that their diets can be sub- supplemented by small amounts of bark, flowers, fruit, fungi, fungus, fungi, mushrooms. Um, epithelium right. stripped from the roots and then invertebrates and even right. um, gorilla right. dung sometimes maybe if they're 
need to recycle it or lacking in a nutrient perhaps, or that that could be a stereotypical behavior. I'm not sure um, where that was being uh, observed, whether it was in the wild or under human care. But at any rate, yeah, I, yeah, this is really fascinating. And now I'm going to need to, I am going to need to dork out about nutrition for a little while with some of my friends to try to, to try to figure yeah. this out. But you're, I mean, right. you're definitely right. They probably did. They have to consume a lot more food to get it, extract as many nutrients as possible uh, from it. Um, right. And it's interesting though, because they're a little bit different than, what I consider to be an, an herbivore that we, you and I are familiar with being that of a cow or a horse that spends 60% of its day eating, right? On average. Right. Because of. Yeah. Yeah. Like almost 70%. Yeah. Mm-hmm, because they need to eat, you know, minimally, you know, two, 3% of their body weight a day. And, but with gorillas, they're only spending about 30% of the day feeding. So that doesn't seem like a, I mean, it's a, it's a fair amount of time. They spend about 30% of their day feeding, 30% of their day traveling, looking for food, and about 40% of their day resting. Now, I can get behind that 40% of their day resting. And I, I, I don't, I, 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 that sounds great. I don't think I do that. Uh, I should do more of it. I'm probably more about of a 30, 30% of my day resting type person. Well, Chris is just still blowing my mind over here that if uh, a typical male mountain gorilla is going to consume about 40, I read even up to 60 pounds of food every day that, you know, if they weigh in at about a 400 pounds, it's 10% of their body weight. I would love to eat 12 pounds of food a day. Wink, wink. That is not my, that is not my weight, but (laughs) (laughs) no, it is. It is. You're, you blow the wind blows. You fall over. Um, but (laughs) yeah, I, and like I said, you know, we're used to horses that are eating two to three, three percent of their body weight a day. So man, I'm fascinated about it, but, but in order for them to get all the nutrients they need, because some of this stuff, the cellulose, probably this high fiber diet isn't getting them the major nutrients that they may need, they can consume about 142 different varieties of plants. And the the silverback, that's what some analysts have said, uh, the types of plants that are in, in their, in his diet. And so when we go back to what we talked about in last, the first episode, as far as why we should care about gorillas, and their role as mm-hmm. help structuring yeah. plant communities. Well, I'm just putting two and two together. I was like, oh, plant, plant communities, like the 10 or 50, 142 mm-hmm. different mm-hmm. varieties and species of plants. So they have a really critical niche as far as their role kind of being the overseer of that, the grazer, the foilivore. Folivor eating the leaves, but they they eat other parts of the plant as well. So, just really, really fascinating. Uh, and and of course, too, they aren't. I keep talking about herbivores. That's probably an inappropriate term with gorillas. Mm-hmm. I would uh, mostly plants, but some omnivore. They will eat different um, uh, invertebrates such as slugs or other insects uh, or meat. Sometimes, even if they find it as they choose. But their diet primarily consists of much easier to find vegetation or, mm-hmm. after my own heart, they they love berries when they can find berries. Uh-huh. Who doesn't, right? Right. Yeah. And the, if if right, you don't like Eastern blueberries, lowlands, you can't like, be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you no. Know, no. You'd support Michigan blueberries. That's right. The, the east, the, I did read the eastern lowlands, about a quarter of their diet is fruit. So oh, wow. where there is fruit available. Okay. The, right, but up are. in the Afro the mountains, Alpine, yeah, it's hard to. There's yeah. not much. You're lucky yeah. if you're fine. I don't yeah, know so if any mountain blueberry varieties, but I wish <laughs> from <laughs> from that part of the world. Yeah. yeah. The I yeah mountain blueberry coffee. I don't know. Uh, yeah, anyways, the, the to digest the cellulose, like you said, so they're colon fermenters. So their digestive system, like I said, is is their large intestines are just bigger. And so the fermentation is anaerobic bacteria breaking down the foodstuffs and getting nutrients out of that. So their colons are larger, tons so of like microbes. H- in, in, gut fermenters. 
similar to horses? Kind of. You don't like yeah, that, yeah. But horses. It's... No, I don't because no, horses have the cecum, right? right. That whereas these really don't. They have our digestive system in theory. It's just not as our large intestine isn't as big as theirs. Right. We'd be pretty stinky or gassy if we did. I guess I don't know. But <laughs> the you know so the bacteria in that hind gut helps break it down, and it's just bigger for them. So ferments, detoxifies the food. So anything that might be toxic to them is broken down and they get their nutrients out of that. So very fast digestive system too. So almost like the pandas, you know, it, you're talking about the different varieties. We know the pandas just have different varieties of bamboo, right? You know, going back to what John was talking about, there's such a pain in the rear in the zoo world they're divas. because they're so picky. <laughs> They're picky. He's like, oh, we go out and spend all this time laying all this food out. They go out, look at it, and go, nope, this sucks, and just sit and protest. You know, and they won't eat. <laughs> so you got to get them in, get find a new growth, and and put it out there for them. So, yeah, it's it's, it's pretty fascinating. And looking at orangutans and gorilla digestive systems, orangutans seem to have a little bit longer. Uh, hind gut or longer large intestine chimpanzees kind of like ours maybe a little bit more developed because they eat a lot more vegetation you know whereas um you know ours is, is is a little bit different so fascinating stuff i mean that they can live off this vegetative diet and get everything they need and we look at their daily activity budget gorillas are spending about 30 percent of their day feeding which I could get behind that. Uh, 30% of their day traveling. I feel like I definitely do that. And then 40% of their day resting. I don't do that. I'm probably about 30% of my day resting. I should, should get 40. Yeah. So yeah. they, yeah, yeah, yeah they, kids. they are not spending a, a large chunk of time eating. They're spending more, obviously more time a day eating than I do. Um, I would love to do that, but I guess I've, I guess I could if I ate 10 pounds of celery a day, right? Uh, but now, not not the cookies that I just jammed in my mouth here when we took a small little break. So, um, mm -hmm. but yeah. And one of my other favorite parts about their resting behavior, 40% of their day, is that they make nests to sleep in. They can be in trees or on steep slopes or even on the ground. And they'll build a nest from surrounding vegetation and they sleep, they construct a new one each evening to sleep in. And only the infants are going to sleep in the same nest as their mom. So everybody has their own little nest, unless, you, uh, unless you're an infant with your mom. And when the sun rises, they'll leave their sleeping site, their nest that they made, and do their activities of feeding and traveling and, of course, resting. Or when it's raining, getting under umbrellas, leaf umbrellas, like you had suggested. And then when it starts to get dark, they will build their nest and so on and so forth. Um, let's see. Okay. And I think it's important to know if you're not as familiar with uh, great apes or gorillas is the mountain gorilla is primarily a terrestrial quadruped, which getting rid of all those science words means they basically just spend a lot of time on the ground. However, they can climb into trees, especially fruit trees. They love fruit when they can find it. Uh, and if the branches can carry their weight, they'll run bipedally up to 20 feet or so. And they may build their nest up above as well. But for the most part, they're a little bit more terrestrial and on the ground than, say, the gibbons that Chris had mentioned earlier in the podcast that are just always up in the trees. No, it's interesting you talk about the nest, Angie, because like I said, uh, you know, when I was 10 years ago, starting to read about gorillas and gorilla conservation and what was going on. And it was looking at nest sites, trying to get a population estimate on the Western lowlands. So they were going around and they can estimate family group size, the troop size, mm -hmm. right? So they're called troops, a uh, family group, which is what up to 30 members yeah. usually average is, is what they, you know, get some young males, juvenile, adult females, babies, and then the silverback that's, what, at mm -hmm. least 12 years old, right, is what I read. So they were able to go and look at these nesting sites around these parks to get an, an, an estimate of mm -hmm. the population. 
right? Because that's it's kind of hard. You know, so how do they do this? Like, how do these scientists do this? Well, there's a method to their madness, to their research, like Angie said in the last episode. You know, go out and and do this. And so, anyways, it's fascinating. Yeah. So the nesting is is so yeah. Cool. It's, it's a it's really so cool critical part of their behavior. You know, for sleeping, and you can't blame them. They're intelligent beings. They want to be comfortable. <laughs> Who doesn't want to be comfortable? Mm-hmm. And the best way to be comfortable is to right. build yourself a little nesting site, nice and cushy with vegetation around them. And if you're a little one, you want to sleep with your mom. So, yeah, I mean, I think, well, and you're probably in the next, you know, 10 or 15 minutes or so, as I'm talking, moving through some of their behaviors, I can't help to relate it to you, me, my kids, my friends, mm-hmm, my in-laws, mm-hmm. because it is, it's it, a lot of it's so, just so similar. And it, that's probably why they're so fun to watch. And uh, whether if you're at your local zoo or documentaries, or if you're is blessed enough to get to go to the wild, which if you stick around with this mm-hmm. and finish this podcast, Chris is going to give you some stats on where to go and how much it costs. So you can save your pennies, yes, <laughs> save yes. your pennies yes. and gold coins yeah. like me. But yeah, many paychecks. <laughs> and we described on the previous episode too about how strong and powerful and big they are, and they're the biggest of the great apes uh, of the primates in general. But they're just known kind of for people that have worked with them and just observing their behaviors is generally a gentle and shy uh, creature, and they'll. And if you're observing them, you're going to see a lot of grooming between males and females, or especially among females. And they don't necessarily mutual groom as much as you might see from chimpanzees or gorillas, but it's still a big part of their social behavior. This mutual grooming, you know, why do they do it? Why? Well, it basically reinforces social bonds and, of course, keeps their hair free from dirt and parasites. And... It's definitely a way for young mothers to bond with their young and vice versa. It it helps the young learn how to communicate and behave within groups. And of course, I think most people, if you've been to a zoo, maybe not necessarily with a gorilla, but definitely somewhere in the primate house or the primate area, you've seen little, little ones, juvenile, either infants or juveniles. And aren't they just the most fun to watch? It's just, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they are, and with gorillas, a lot of times the juveniles will be up more arboreal in the trees, more so than the typical terrestrial adults. And they're wrestling and chasing and doing somersaults and and moving from branch to branch and just a lot of activity, right? Like. I read your favorite that they love, because I know you studied this and you did this study in your master's work, right? Play behavior Mm -hmm. with horses Mm -hmm. in the young ones. So they love to wrestle and somersaults and chase and play with their parents and just, they're they're like our youngsters running around the house crazy. Ah, Well, in just this evening, Xander was like, mommy, throw me on the couch, flip me upside down. I wanted it. And then of course, Zach is the same thing. Flip me, throw me, flip me. You know, it's like if somebody like just (laughs) caught a little video of me, like flipping my kid on the couch, they would probably call, you know, the child protective services on me, but (laughs) (laughs) no, you're an amazing, you're an amazing mother. uh, But no, I mean, the boys uh, love, and I've got boys too. So they're rough and tumble. My boys are, you know, I got, I got some linebackers coming up up here, although that's debatable. We want them to play baseball. Uh, But yeah, I know, but they're wild. (laughs) They're like wild, wild animals. And I think it's because we share so much DNA with gorillas and chimpanzees, mm-hmm. it, it makes sense. And that's why when you do get to go either watch yeah. a documentary or, or visit your local zoo and you see uh, the, you know, the juvenile primates being wild, Plain, you know, you yeah. can relate to it. It's super fun. Yeah. And so the young are always entertaining yeah. and, and just in general, yeah. uh, we'll touch on it a little bit more, but gorillas just display so many human like behaviors and emotions. I mean, from Mm -hmm. laughter to Mm -hmm. sadness, of course, they, as Chris mentioned previously, they make their own tools in the forest to help them survive everything from umbrellas. Uh, I know, especially in chimpanzees, you know, the termite sticks and things like that to uh, Mm -hmm. get, you know, for eating. And so their intelligence is just beyond, you know, beyond comparison to a lot of 
other species mm-hmm. we've covered. Um, and their social nature of them as well. Humans, whether, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, we're all social. You have to be social. It's how, we, it's how we've evolved, right? And looking yeah. back, as Chris did such a mm-hmm. nice job mm-hmm. in the previous pod about the evolution of hominids or gorillas and why it's so cool mm-hmm. and, and so important and what the change that we really aren't that different and didn't branch off from them too long ago. Mm-hmm. And part mm-hmm. of the reason we were able to be successful when you think about predation back in the day is because we were social safety in numbers. Mm-hmm. And, it, numbers. you know, as yeah, more as, as tech, technology and all the smartphones are making us less social, uh, it is, a, it's kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon that's happening because historically it was us coming together, telling stories, protecting each other that helped, I think us evolve this far. So it, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, I, I I I don't know why I just the movie Wally always where we're going. <laughs> you remember at the end of Wally with all the people in the chairs, yeah. and they just have their screens in front of their. That's where yeah. we're going. But at the end, like the ship breaks down and they all start noticing each other and like, oh hey, so you know, isn't it, it like you know we are looking about technology and and I think this is a a, a lesson. This is why I'm I'm going off on this tangent. Sorry, but you know we do text a lot. We do talk on phones or whatever. Um, don't you just feel better? Like, I know we all need our alone time and things, but when you're around yes. other people, like when you're social with your friends yes. and family, yes. people you love, it's, there, well, you know, it's, it's dopamine. You there's, feel there's literally a fuller. chemical neurotransmitter of dopamine. There you go. Mm-hmm. The biology. Yep. Yep. And some oxytocin, like especially with the ones you love. And it is strong biology Absolutely. behind it, which gives us an advantage sure. for survival. So these higher and primates, same thing. Things, we're yeah. just like them. Mountain gorillas are highly social. They live in relatively stable, cohesive groups together. The bonds are long term, uh, especially between adult males and females. Relationships among females can be weak um, as they move in and out, and uh, and sometimes they're non-territorial. And then, of course, as Chris had kind of hinted to, they have this dominant male silverback and he's called a silverback because the the hair on his back literally changes from blackish brown to silver and chris will put some nice pictures in the show notes if you're not familiar with what they look like because they're stunning oh they're always so handsome i love when i go to zoos and i see this silverback Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um but he's the main dude and he basically you know he's a dude in charge and he will maintain the social unit and the harem of females and their offspring, which of course includes some juvenile males. And regarding the mountain gorillas, about 61% of the groups of them that are very, very well identified, if you will, and studied more or less because Mm -hmm. they're so highly protected, uh, which is wonderful that the, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, and Congolese government have taken such amazing steps to help protect these critically endangered mountain gorillas. But about 61% of the groups are composed of one adult male, one of these silverbacks, and a lot of females. And about the remaining like 36% or so contain more than one males. And a lot of times those can be uh, like loners, like gorillas remaining together to try to figure out Mm -hmm. Till they can get their own group, basically. It's a, often in zoos, we use the term bachelor herds or bachelor troops. Um, in general, most of these groups are non territorial and they don't really like conflict. So they're going to try to, that's when this whole like their gentle giants type thing comes along. Um, you, you but, say, just to interrupt you real quick, I mean, gentle giants, and one of the things I read is, is they are shy by nature. And it's kind of funny listening. If you haven't listened to Ron Evans, please go back and listen to that episode. That episode, that interview is Absolutely amazing, incredible. Yeah, mm-hmm. and he jokes, "Oh, there's only been you know one out of three make it seeing gorillas you know in the wild," which isn't true. He's like, "No, it's totally safe. They've never had any incidents because they're habituated to humans and things like that." Sure. And he actually talks about when he went deep, deep in I think the Congo to find gorillas that weren't habituated, and they stuck him out front because he understands gorilla behavior. And they ran into a troop and he was fine. But 
if they're threatened, they will turn aggressive and they sure, will Chris, yes. fight to the death. The females will fight to the death protecting their babies. So, you know, absolutely. Yes. They, I mean, they, severe aggression is very rare in stable groups. Um, but yes, if two silverback males come upon each other and they don't pick up on the signals of like, hey, you go that way, I go that way. Um, yeah, they've got these deep, they've got canines and they can cause some deep injuries and it can lead to death. Uh, and so generally, I, generally because they don't want that to happen, they're smart enough to know that they don't, you know, one silverback running into another silverback is smart enough to know like, yeah, I don't think I want to pick this fight usually. So for this reason, the conflict is usually going to resolve itself before it gets bad right? Because they are these kind of gentle giants or whatever. And so the way they do this is they have phenomenal communication, which I'm not going to give it justice here uh, because I'm not, uh, I'm not a primatologist. I don't, I, I, I want to be, <laughs> I want to be yeah, I know, uh, I know. primatologist, you know, be uh, a person that studies gorilla or chimpanzee behavior. But this ritualized charge display basically has a sequence of first they'll start hooting, which is a vocalization They'll do what's called sim, uh, symbiotic feeding. So I don't know if they're trying to pretend to eat or something. I haven't, I haven't seen that behavior, so I'd have to look that up. But um, they'll stand up uh, bipedally, okay? So they look bigger. They throw vegetation. <laughs> I can see that. That's yes, that's yes, that's yeah. a, that's in all of us, right? Just to throw yes. stuff. Uh, <laughs> throw we stuff. all have that. It makes us feel and better. Then, mm -hmm. And then they'll do some chest beating with cupped hands. They'll do a, a one leg kick. And then sometimes if the, you know, if the other silverback's not picking up what the other one's putting down, then it might progress to sideways running on four legs, slapping and tearing vegetation down, uh, thumping the ground with the palms. And so, you know, if they can't it's then gotta figure be it out. Terrifying. terrifying. Yeah. Well, and that's why uh -huh. I think to both of them, it, you know, yeah. it, it makes, it makes one of them usually back down in both, in most cases, both gorillas will like, you know, will, will t you know, they'll, if one stands the ground and leaves the other one alone, like they'll turn away. And that's what researchers that have had issues with them, you know, they know kind of what to do and they, and they understand what to like, do. And yeah, mm -hmm, they Body understand language. the behavior and, and, and they'll, you know, before it escalates, they'll know to like, not let it get that far. Right. And, and I would just say for us, right. The listeners, imagine when you, you, if you've seen it in your real life, or you watch these videos online or whatever of, of people losing it, like going crazy and doing these behaviors. How do you feel? You're shocked and you're scared in some instances. And it's, it's a warning, get away, right? So the alpha male is like, I'm losing it. <laughs> you better run away or the other guy's like, I'm losing it too. And now you have a big fight. And you then know? it's and bad. It's, yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah. and obviously, but just think of our, I'm just saying like our emotions, they're going to feel our emotions too, because we're so closely related, Oh, absolutely. you know, so absolutely. yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. And then if you have the, you know, if you come across the tracks of a gorilla and you obviously shouldn't be, or you don't want to be there, you just jump in some water and they'll leave you alone. So they are not, like water, they yeah. are typically <laughs> not fans of water. So you're, you know, you're, you're safe there. So find a big puddle or a river or something. Uh, but yeah, so these males are going to typically leave their natal group, the group that they're born with to either go form their own troop or a bachelor troop or whatever around 11 years of age. Okay. So that's kind of when that's, you know, their teenage years, a little older than teenage, ready to go start off on their own thing. However, keep in mind that at the age of 11, a male can't join an established group. And so he spends a lot of his time solitary until he can kind of start getting his own click going. And that's usually around 15 or so. Um, so, you know, very mature, right? If you think of their lifespan and almost similar to us, like you probably really shouldn't go on your, my boys are not going on their first date till they're 15. Are you kidding me? Yeah, 15, yeah, I guess <laughs> that's you driving them to the movies, dropping them off and picking them up. Totally, right? totally. So, or, or if yeah. they're 16, they can drive. I'll just be in the back seat of the minivan. That's fine. That's right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> uh, and a female is going to be ready to maybe transfer from her natal group, the group she's been born in, uh, around eight years of age. And she can sometimes join a lone male and then they can start their own low ranking family and go from there. 
So, you, you know, I think thinking about that and, and you're going to get to reproduction here in a second, you know, talking about generation intervals and things and, and some of the, the things that they're faced with, but listening to you talk about their behaviors, obviously it's making me think of my own children or my own <laughs> life, you know, running into yeah, gorilla like yeah, yeah. people in the wild of California and Florida and Texas, other places, and New Zealand, you know, all the wild down there. So, I mean, just intelligent level, like it's just, they, and, and I know we think or orangutans are, are more intelligent of the great apes just below us. Right. And we think chimpanzees aren't that uh, chimpanzees are brilliant too. They're just a little bit more violent. And we, you know, we're gorillas in that whole mix because they're pretty dang smart from what I read. Right. So of course, gorillas are very intelligent and, uh, I think compare it, you know, compared to chimpanzees or bonobos or orangs. I mean, they have different things that they are known for. Like chimpanzees are a little bit more known for tool making. And so, but when you look at maybe some of the social behavior and definitely like the communi patterns of communication and emotional intelligence, I mean, tit for tat, I don't know who's smarter, but all the great apes are just, I, I mean, they, you know, they pass mirror tests as far as the way that scientists uh, classify higher levels of intelligence. And so if your gorilla is going to, you know, beat almost everything out of the water besides, I guess, us, right? Because we have, we have, I guess, culture and, uh, and more of a language. But even that's a little bit, we're, you know, even, even that could be debated or we're learning a lot about that. Because all primates have complex patterns of co communication, but a lot, as far as gorillas are concerned, they definitely have 25 or so distinct vocalizations that are used for group, communi group communication. Um, and sounds, of course, can be anything from grunts to barks um, to squeaks to, to screams or roars. Right? They've got they've got warning calls, so. And they have uh, deep belches is a way that it's described rumbling, which makes me laugh because that sounds like me <laughs> yeah. and my boys, right? Like we, we definitely yeah. have our own belching language in my yeah. family, right? Belches and farts. My goodness. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Um, so, so, but yeah. they, but they have, yeah, Little exactly, boys. Boys. but they have whimpers and whines by infants. They have play chuckles. They have uh, basically like threat displays and, some of them even have like syllables and long they're they can be longer or shorter. So their calls and their communication is just incredible. And of course the communication abilities of gorillas have been studied uh, when gorillas are housed under human care and continues to be studied, of course, but you know, in particular, I mean, most people have probably heard of uh, the famous, infamous gorilla Coco, who passed away uh, just a few years ago. And she was the gorilla that was taught the American Sign Language. And Coco could use over 500 signs and understand spoken English for the most part. Um, because, of course, gorillas don't have the vocal cords to make it possible for her to speak. So that's why sign language was chosen. And there has been a ton of, I, I, I went, this is the rabbit hole that I went in uh, this past week or so is trying to understand more about their language because language is such a big part of what we consider to make um, an, whether an animal's intelligent or not, which I think there's a lot of very, there's a lot of, there's going to be more flex in what is considered higher cognition. Um, but we are definitely hung up on language. And so the fact that Coco and I know a couple, you know, I know other chimpanzees and uh, orangutans have been taught some sign language out there trying to understand that a little bit and reading um, a lot, a lot of the different um, discussions and research on it as far as Coco her understanding, because a lot of people, uh, the researchers that she lived and worked with, I mean, 
just really make a lot of claims about her ability to understand the human language and about her ability to uh, feel and project things. And if you haven't watched any of the documentaries or done uh, any of the research on it, I, I highly recommend that you do. But scientists, Chris and I always talk about a lot in this pod about scientists, we love to question things and we're skeptical. And so I always want to say, well, if Coco did this, uh, can another gorilla do it and have a language of, you know, 500 signs and have, have all the, be able to basically sign not only nouns, but verbs and, and feelings like she supposedly could sign sad and all these kinds of things. And, and there's just brilliant documentaries on this gorilla and she really brought gorilla intelligent to the forefront. And so I think regardless of how exactly in depth her language was compared to human language, she did a lot for, I think helping her fellow wild gorillas out is just bringing bringing out and highlighting how much they gorillas are like us and how much they deserve our protection and how much uh, we have yet to learn about them. But of course, there's always the flip side of it is a lot of other primatologists are saying, wait, 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 this hasn't been totally repeated. And we might need to look a little bit more in depth as far as was this just, was there some operant conditioning going on, which that's, that's my baby. That's what I love studying. Um, was this just what they call the clever Hans effect? And what that is, is clever Hans is a horse that was trained to count. Well, you know, all this story. He was, he, yes. was, he could do, yes. he could yes. do math, I like crazy hard math, <laughs> math that you and I would need a calculator to do. Like he could do it and he would paw with his one foot. He would paw out the answer. Like, so each, you know, he'd count up to 17 or whatever the answer of the mathematical question was. And it was blowing people's minds for, a, for a long, long time. And, Basically, they realized, and his trainer, the person that worked with him, didn't even realize this. He, you know, thought his horse was a genius too, basically. But there was subtle facial cues that the trainer didn't know he was giving that he could give, that he would give, and the horse knew when he had got the right answer, when he had counted to whatever number. And so yeah. they took. Exp- <laughs> he was very clever, and so he they was took clever. experiments where they actually pulled the trainer out of the room and and the horse couldn't answer without the trainer in the room. Right. Because, he, but the trainer was like, no, 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 I'm not doing anything. And, but it was just, these very, I mean, horses of course have a very, are very, they're very socially intelligent because they live in herds. And I think when, and so they could pick up on these subtle cues that the trainer was giving and dogs are very similar. And so anyways, it's a fast, sorry, I'm not, I'm totally going off on a tangent here, but Coco, Coco to me just symbolizes that there's a lot that we, a lot to explore as far as what they can know and understand and feel. And we know they are super intelligent. We know they feel a lot. Can they use our language to express what, what they feel according to Coco and the staff that worked with her? Absolutely. Um, Others have, other scientists of course have, you know, paused question at that or taken maybe, well, it might not be as good as it sounds, you know, if something's too good to be true, it usually, it, you know, it might be. So more research is definitely needed. And, but in the same instance, the cocoa experiment is probably not going to be able to be repeated again because some have questioned, I mean, sh- some have questioned the ethical fact of having a gorilla living away from other gorillas, not it's one thing to live under human care, but another thing to mm-hmm. not live in a family troop and to have a chance to be a normal gorilla and interact in a social way. And so I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't see that experiment maybe being relived the same way that it was, that it was 30 years ago when ethics and there wasn't such a spotlight on ethics, which there should be. I mean, we should hold any animal that's under human care should be held to the highest scrutiny as the animal living in its most natural setting, in its most natural way, that kind of thing. And so uh, the experiment may not be able to be repeated, but we just, we know that they have a language and it's definitely a, a lot of, uh, that they're built, they're able to learn symbols, categorization, sequence, um, almost statistical learning. And so, and then they have tons of feelings of, of cooperation and community pragmatics things like that. So 
You know, it's fascinating stuff, Angie. I mean, the, the especially the behaviors in these higher order animals, it's it always fascinates me. And you're the one that brought me into the behavior world and really opened my eyes to it when you did your your master's work, which is just phenomenal. So it's a great field. But we study repro. <laughs> that was our babies. <laughs> so, and your behavior study was looking at reproduction stuff it was, to an it extent. Was. It was. But, you know, how do gorillas reproduce, you know, stuff like that? Sure. Life? Well, it's fun. I mean, there's some differences than us. Well, it de- I guess it depends on what who you are. I don't want to I don't want to put anybody in a new box, but <laughs> mountain gorillas are polygonous. Polygonous. So that means the dominant male, the silverback in each group has exclusive access to all the females in the group. Uh, so a little bit different than my household, but you never know. I mean, there's uh, to each their own, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, but I think what's really important to highlight is they are, they share a lot of genetics with us, a lot of DNA. So therefore, similar to us, the reproductive rates are very slow. And a female may only have two to six offspring over her 40-year lifespan. And they don't, as I previously mentioned, they don't mature and reproduce until females are 10 or so and males probably 15 years, right? So they've got to, you know, they've got to escape jaguars and the pressures of humans to for many, many years before they can even start to think about reproduction. And then when they are of breeding age, once again, they're in this family troop, this, this harem where the male is pretty much breeding all the females and the female is going to have, is going to show the male signs that she is ready for breeding because She has an estrus cycle, so she does not menstruate, which is what us humans do, right? We we have a menstrual um, uh, cycle where we actually, you know, we'll shed our uterine lining and produce blood. Uh, Gorillas don't do that, and they have an estrus cycle that lasts between 30 and 33 days. And when they are ovulating, they do have very subtle signs that it's time for the male to breed them, which is definitely different than what's seen in chimpanzees because chimpanzees um, have very obvious physiological changes. Um, They have uh, what's called the sexual swellings in their genitalia and the female that are, you know, very visual signs to the male that they are an estrus and ready to breed. Uh, Same thing with bonobos. But gorillas, once again, they're just kind of these shy, gentle giants. They're they're more subtle in their behavior. Um, But when a male does breed a female and she becomes pregnant, her gestation period, can you guess how long it is? Eight and a half months. Oh, you're good. Yes, you cheated. You read the notes. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm just smart. I just know. You are very smart. You are very smart. Yes. So, of course. Don't ask me any other species. Yeah. I know that. Oh, I know horses 11 months, but yeah. Yeah. So, but it it makes sense. I mean, just like, you know, uh, you know, I mean, so many similarities, right? Like with humans, our menstrual cycle is about 28 days, their estrus cycle is is, uh, about you know, 30 days. And yes, we are pregnant typically for nine months. They're pregnant for about eight and a half months. It takes a long time to develop a baby with a big brain and a big head and all that. Um, But similar to us, like when they're born, it's usually a single and the young is very dependent on the, on the mom. And, and gorillas, I was really fascinated. Um, Weaning doesn't often occur until three years of age. So all you, all you mamas out there breastfeeding your three-year-olds, you're doing it like the gorillas do. (laughs) So (laughs) good for you, right? Uh, And now females will provide most of the parental care. Um, They nurse and carry their young for about up, yeah, yeah, three to four years. And they play with them and they teach them things and a lot of grooming. And, but it's really important because uh, mortality for infants in mountain girls is about 38%. So, and that's from like birth to three years. So when we talk about that, plus their slow reproductive rates and life cycle in general, it's really important that these females, you know, take our great caregivers and keep their eye on their, on their young, which I, as a mother 
am like nervous, even in the grocery store. I'm like, these kids are going to like get away from me and, <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, I never see them again. They're <laughs> yeah. going to break something yeah. or hurt themselves or whatever. Yeah. So I can only imagine if there was trees involved. Um, so yeah, it's really, you know, the moms get a lot of credit, but Chris, I was very, I'm very excited to report for you. We yeah, he's a great dad. Yes. <laughs> he's a great dad. The gorilla is a great dad and a really important part of the family unit. And as far as keeping this 38% infant mortality rate down is basically falls on the hands of the silverback. And he basically defends the families and the offspring from those, all those threat charges and beating of the chest and throwing the vegetation and all those kind of interesting behaviors. He does that and protects them and has a, uh, a really good role of protecting him. But also like you, Chris, like I've watched you with your sons and my husband with our boys. The dad has a really big role in socializing the infants. Uh, and and playing with them and bonding with them, especially during times of weaning, right? Uh, which I know you can relate to. And so yes. <laughs> it's, you know, and, and they really take on an active role for caring for them and in this, this social kind of play. And it's really cool if you've ever watched any documentaries or are at your local zoo to, to see this humongous 400 pound silverback, like, playing with like a 30 pound delinquent juvenile, yeah. you know, infant just <laughs> yeah. being naughty yeah. and like jumping on them yeah. and, and, and just, you know, teasing them and chasing them yeah. and bothering them. And, and, and they, and they love it. Like they, that's like their, they, they'll do that. And, um, so they're just, and especially gosh forbid, if something happens to the mom, uh, you know, she gets caught by poachers or something. It's actually the silverback is the one who steps in and looks after the abandoned offspring. Uh, well, and mm-hmm. he'll, and, and they've documented times when this does happen, that the silverback will actually let the, um, the infant sleep in his nest, which yeah. nobody yeah, sleeps see? in silverback nest, except for yes, if no, an infant really needs little babies. Him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so that's, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. You know, if you think about that, I mean, they definitely we've we've talked about a lot of good dads on this podcast. The seahorse still being number one, yeah, because <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's basically the mom. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right, but uh, I I definitely have to. But yeah, I definitely think that the the mountain grill or grills in general uh, play a really really big role, and um, and they're. You know, and they're a lot of fun to watch interacting with these young people. And we'll just say, I mean, Honey Badger, Dad, he just doesn't care. He just doesn't care. You know, <laughs> honey Badger, he don't care. He don't care. <laughs> he doesn't care, you know. So when we're looking at conservation, mountain gorillas, and this is directly off IUCN's website, reported in 2018 of 1,004 individuals, and it is going up. So they're bouncing between critically endangered and endangered. The the other species or subspecies are critically endangered because their populations mm-hmm. are going down. The mountain gorillas are going up because what we talked about in the last podcast, and we're going to talk about here in a second, ecotourism. The locals in Rwanda and Uganda and the work of Diane Fossey and, and others, World Wildlife Fund, other wildlife zoos. organizations are really yeah. fighting hard, zoos fighting hard. And their and their governments, the I mean, the Ugandan, Rwanda, yeah. and Congolese government should be applauded yeah. because I mean, it is definitely you know they yeah. are highly protected. They're supporting these efforts, highly absolutely. Protected. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, if we look at some of the other species, just really quick, the western gorilla is considered critically endangered because it's going down, but their population, western lowlands, about three hundred sixteen thousand, mm-hmm. but it's decreasing each year. In the last decade, it's gone down by oh, 20%. Geez. Yeah. So they're under tremendous pressure. The eastern gorilla, the the lowland, critically endangered at 3,800 individuals. Mm-hmm. So, and population decreasing. So really, they're worried about genetic diversity. You know, they don't want, you know, I was reading this researcher talking about inbreeding. And they use the Tasmanian devil as an example, which, again, if you haven't listened to that episode, you need to. Because talking about the transmissible cancer is because of the sure. inbreeding. That is why it, it, it came up in that population. So, you know, Tasmanian devils may right. go extinct. And then also Ron, you know, Ron's interview, 
a lot of going into, you know, what ecotourism is doing and how that has helped. And like we said in the last episode, you know, helping getting the, the locals involved, buying in, and they're benefiting from all oh, of that. Yeah. Well, yes, Chris. And I mean, it is great news that this populous mountain gorilla population is increasing, but the researchers and conservationists and government officials are do remain skeptical because of about 60% of the thousand remaining mountain gorillas are habituated to the presence of humans and therefore on a daily basis come in close contact or even physical contact with people. And so therefore with their genetic similarity to humans means they're highly susceptible to human pathogens and mm -hmm. human pathogens have caused illness and death in mountain gorillas before. So there's outbreaks of Ebola and other things where you just, it's a risk, but I, I do think that the ecotourism and the ability to garner support in the local community internationally and awareness is is important, but and I'm sure they have very you know very strict rules mm -hmm. and things like that as far as when you are coming in in contact with these gorillas. Uh, but the other thing that's um, mm -hmm. really kind of threatening, still threatening these guys, is there's a lot of significant dependence on resources in mountain gorilla habitat, and so the environment mm -hmm. there is a little bit in trouble. And so there's of course habitat loss, which is a common theme we see talk about a lot on this podcast uh and there's um the gorillas that live inside Virunga National Park charcoal is really in an important part an important fuel source mm -hmm. for cooking and heating and so although charcoal productions it's illegal and illegal it's a multi-million dollar industry and it's destroyed a lot of gorilla habitat there is still some mm -hmm. poaching. Of course, these animals are highly protected, but once in a while, um, the demand for their bush meat or pet trade, um, these animals can get caught in snares. So, and, you know, between habitat loss, disease, uh, charcoal making, poaching, uh, then the another really big one is war. And, I mean, in Rwanda, mm -hmm. since the 1990s, they've been in civil unrest as well as the Congo have had a lot of mm -hmm. issues. And so the government's still pulling together to make it, make it right for these animals. But still, I mean, it's, you know, if a country is in civil unrest, it's hard to, to say that they can always commit to such things or the, or that the people living in those areas aren't going to get desperate and try to do some poaching or other things, which hopefully mm -hmm. they won't. Yeah. And I think, but yeah, and I, th and I think Rwanda and Uganda are pretty, calm now yes compared to the 90s right Correct. when the 90s were pretty bad yes so in the last 20 years things have have settled there but you're right in the congo it's still pretty sketchy right so i mean that's the thing is there you know we love that they're increasing and this is like it was it's been actually a good news story i think they're um and this has been a good story. It's uh, because they are an animal that has gone to show when a lot of effort uh, has been put into place that their numbers can can really increase over over time because there's uh, the re reproduction rate so slow, but in the same instance, any little issue with such low genetic viability and all these other threats can really be detrimental to a population. So we got to keep a close eye on them. And how do we do that, Chris? Yeah, what? Who's who's? I mean, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people fighting for gorillas, but who's one of the organizations you highlighted this week? Yeah, Chris, I want to touch on a couple zoos that are doing great work for gorillas. Lincoln Park Zoo uh, does a lot of research over in um, in the Congo. Cincinnati Zoo, obviously, your interview talks a lot about the amazing work that they're doing over there, like boots on the ground type stuff. Uh, but the main organization I uh, will uh, want to highlight today is the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International. And they have a great, just type in um, Diane, that's D-I-A-N, Fossey is F-O-S-S-E-Y, into Facebook or into the Google, um, or go to gorillafund.org. And the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International is a non-for-profit um, group that was founded in 1978 to preserve and protect the world's last mountain gorillas. So, I mean, they're pretty 
amazing and they've done a ton of research in conservation in education of i mean they're one of the reasons this increasing population we're talking about here celebrating today on the podcast their big this group is a big player in the ground of why that why that was able to happen yeah no she that was one of the the rabbit holes i went down was because i mean gorillas in the mist Great movie. It's still very popular. It, it, I, please watch it if you haven't seen it. It is t- very touching. It's a very touching movie. I'm not, I'm not going to go too much into her favorite gorilla, Digit, but Digit was found killed, and, and it was just horrible. But Diane Fossey, uh, one of my heroes, she oh, for was sure. born in San Francisco. Hero. Yeah. Oh, she's amazing. Born in San Francisco in 1932. She traveled to Africa in 1963. She saved up. It was her dream to go there. And she went from Kenya to the Congo and she met Dr. Louis Leakey, ah, who yes. changed her life. And that is like, it really hit me hard because as a professor and as all the, the, the students I've interacted with and I still interact with, like able to influence somebody's life and life decision in a positive way, you know, that kind of hit home with me and in, in her story. So Dr. Leakey was at the Old Old Dolby Gorge and he visited with with Diane and he told her about Jane Goodall's work who we did get to meet. Yes. Oh, you know, that was one of my day. other all-time favorites. But he was telling her, "Oh, I got this, you know, young British woman working in Tanzania looking at chim- chimpanzees." And so he started to talk to her about long-term field studies with great apes. And so Diane was able to go and see mountain gorillas in Uganda and she, she, she ponied up with a wildlife documentary team to see them. And so she went home to the States, you know, obviously that had a huge impact on her. A couple of years later in 1966, Dr. Leakey was touring the U S and she worked hard to meet with him to get to see him again. And he got to talking to her, talk to her about his long-term gorilla project but he needed funding, which we all know and as researchers, you need the money. So he finally got it in 1967. So then she went to the Congo and began her studies on gorillas. And she was really the, one of the first people to have learned how to habituate hu- gorillas to human presence. So she understood gorilla behavior, understood that, and was able to really get the methods down on how to approach and study them. Cool. Without, yeah. you know, either interfering with them Upsetting or them, them, you know, attacking yeah. her, things like that. Yeah. She imitated their voice calls, scratching, you know, things like that to kind of show, hey, I'm not, I'm not, you know, danger. Now in 1967, the Congo where it was Zaire at the time, there was a lot of unrest. So she bailed and relocated to Uganda. Long story short, you know, she gained recognition over time. National Geographic was covering her and she was fighting poachers in Uganda and she, she was doing active conservation, like doing things in the movie. You can see some of this. It's, it's really good. So in, she, she worked in there for a long time. In 1980, she went back to work at Cornell university. She wrote her book, Gorillas in the Mist. So that's on my reading list now. Oh, absolutely. I, I definitely want to you know, do that. So then she went back in 1985. So she took five years in the States, probably was missing it, came home. And, and this is the sad part is she was found murdered shortly thereafter. And they don't know who killed her, but you know, she was, you know, putting a thorn in poacher sides. She, you know, even the locals didn't really like her because she was doing this act of conservation. So they, they never found out who exactly murdered her, but, um, you know, her legacy lives on. She, because of her, you know, she has done so much that we can new, we now can do ecotourism because of her, the mountain gorillas are still here and increasing because of that one person. So to the listeners, you know, you, you, Angie and I say this all the time. One person can make a difference. Oh, absolutely. You can make a difference, Mm -hmm. you know, for a species or animals worldwide. We interview these people all the time. They're making a difference and you listeners out there can make a difference. So to finally get to the ecotourism part, because I know we've talked over two hours, the combined episode, but these animals deserve it. I mean, they just, it's such a touching story. The, 
Gorilla Tours are, again, very, very popular since 2006. And just for example, it, it, since, since then, yeah, Uganda, Rwanda, and the Congo have uh, had ecotourists come in, have had a million tourists, about a million come in, and they've raised about $75 million wow. for the local economy, mm -hmm. U.S. So, and, and that's about 90% of the country's annual foreign income. I mean, a huge, huge yeah. amount of money that has helped these impoverished regions. Now, doing a little bit of research on where you can go and see these, the best spot is Rwanda and Uganda mm -hmm. because they, they're, they're, you're guaranteed to see the gorillas pretty much okay. um, if you go. So a couple things that, that I found on this. Like Angie said, if you're sick, do not go. Do not yes, go see – don't trek you. out to yes. see the gorillas because you, you can get them sick. And then you could potentially wipe out the population or something. We don't want to do that, you know. So – don't do that. They, they do train you. And I asked this about Ron, like, how do you learn? You know, they do say, do these certain behaviors, you know, don't look them in the eye, things like that. They only allow eight people at a time to go see a family, okay. a gorilla family. Mm -hmm. You you only have an hour. So that's it. You get one hour with them because they don't want to. Oh, uh, yes. You know, I, obviously. No, I like that. Yeah. 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 So it's very strictly controlled, but you have to pay a lot of your money goes to paying for the permits mm -hmm. to, to actually go out and do this. Now there's other parts of Africa where you can see them, but I'm just saying right now, Rwanda and Uganda, you can guarantee to go see the mountain gorillas and pay for that. Now, how much? <laughs> now, now we're, some, some when it's details. not about the money, it's about the money, Chris. <laughs> how much do I need to save? Okay. So, so for you and John, for two people, it's about sixteen hundred dollars for camping. Okay, so this is rough and tumble. It this is the not the the going on safari. You're out there in the bush. You know you can spend about sixteen hundred dollars for a five day trip. Okay. If it's a budget, so maybe you guys would spend seventeen eighteen hundred dollars on the budget trip. So okay, and that's for two people you know, though, your, right? Your room's not quite as nice. Okay. Two people, eighteen hundred per person. Okay, per person. Oh, okay. oh per person. Uh, I'm giving you prices. Oh per person, man, I per was person. like I five was, days. But I was, oh man, I was like, that's actually not that bad. Five and days. Her, yeah. But no, no, no. Five no, days. But listen, listen. This is this is a cool trip. This is a cool trip. This is the one I found and and emailed back and forth. Mid range or luxuries anywhere from two thousand to twenty four hundred. So if you're like kind of the luxury tourist or whatever, and you need that, we're probably in the budget mid range. Yeah, you know? I don't need that. No. <laughs> I don't want. I wouldn't camp. mind it. I would like yeah. it, but I don't need it. Now, if you, me, and two other, like if and John and my significant other, we all went, it would be budget would be fourteen hundred per person. Okay, so okay, the bigger so your more group, people you bring, it goes yeah. down. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is just the one tour operator that I found, but this is a five day trip. This is a cool trip. So not only now you still have to pay for your your airfare to get there and sure, sure, inside and out cheap. these five days. So for the five days. You help pay for the permits. So you have a canoe ride up to Lake Bonayoni, a game drive to Queen Elizabeth National Park, a boat cruise at the Kazinga Channel, chimp trekking. Okay. So all these things that it provides for. So you not only see gorillas, you can go see chimpanzees on this one. That's cool. Okay. So yeah. it's, it's a cool one. I'm going to throw this one up, but just to give you an idea, I mean, then you think about airfare, you're probably looking at 3,500 to 4,000 for a, a robust trip to Africa. Cause I'm going to go to Rwanda and then I'm going to jump over to Tanzania. Like it's right next sure. door. So yeah. I'm, I'm right. going it's over to the Gorgor exactly. crater. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you save up about four grand a person. You can, you can go do this for, from, from us, from the States, you know, for okay. our listeners in Europe, our listeners in Africa, it's going to be a little bit cheaper. But if you just get there, it's about sixteen hundred bucks. You can go see mountain okay. gorillas. You know, very very few left. Okay, we've talked about gorillas for going on three hours now. I just conservation tip of the week. Ron brought this up in his interview. Here's your tip: recycle your cell phone. Period. We've brought it up before. Okay. Angie brought it up. Recycle your cell phones. Do not throw them away because you're carrying a little bit of gorilla habitat in your cell phone. It's the mineral coltan. It's very rare. The Cincinnati Zoo has, I think he said over 100,000 cell phones they've already recycled. They have a Go Bananas program. I'm going to put the link on the show notes. 
you want to recycle your cell phone because there's, there's parts in there that are impacting the central part of Africa. And the more we recycle, the less gorilla habitat we'll lose. Okay. So please everybody in the, for the rest of your lives, always recycle your cell phones, your laptops, your tablets, all of those things have a little bit of gorilla. And it's really easy. Obviously your, uh, you know, your local zoo will probably have an initiative too, but just, if not, if you don't live near us, just get online and they will tell you how to do it, where to go. Other stores sometimes will recycle them, but there's no need for us to keep uh, drilling and mining in this gorilla habitat no, for this no. rare element if we can just recycle it, right? And yeah, recycle everything. Yep. Everybody has a cell phone. And the other thing too, and this is my, all oh, this is me on my high horse, but I don't think you need to get a new cell phone every year. Do uh-huh. you? No. Do you really? No. Do you really no. need it? Um, that's what our the, the marketers yeah. want us to do that, right? That's why yeah. they try to make, oh, yeah. this one's upgraded. Upgrade, yeah. upgrade. Keep your phone until it's broken. When it's broken, recycle it, period. Yep. 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 So recycle just for us. I'm going to let you go, but please send this podcast to a friend. Please. Yes. Ask them to yes. listen to gorillas. Yes. Yes. And, uh, and please send us requests of more species. Uh, we'll be asking about feedback as far as a two part episode uh, and yes. see what you guys Let like. Us know. If you like yeah. the longer extended versions or the, the quick, shorter versions, we're here to please. So let us know. Yes. And thanks for listening. <laughs> and hopefully you got, uh, you learned a little bit about gorillas today and yourselves and yourselves. I, well, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I learned a lot about, yeah. like I said, my friends, my kids, my in laws, you, yeah. me. Yeah. So it's been, it's been fun. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. All right, let's start planning to go uh, see girls in the wild there. I know. Oh, my gosh. Start saving those pennies. We only need, like, a lot of them. (laughs) A few million. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Listen. Learn. Share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.